Hello and welcome to the program. My name is Luke Hunt and this is another podcast for Beyond the Mekong series, which is published by The Diplomat. And with me today from the United States is Melody Machuski, who has a new book out called Intrepid Paths. Melody, welcome to the program. Thank you very much, Luke. Very happy to be here. Now, uh, the book was released in May uh, this year and it goes back to your uh, intrepid days in 1974 when you travelled through the country. And uh, I, I like the blurb, uh, Intrepid Path, Burma, makes visible, undocumented, everyday experiences that shape the lives of ordinary Burmese women. Now, obviously, Burma has changed a lot just in the last three years. What was it like back then? Take us back to those early days when you were uh, skipping through the country. <laughs> um, my later to be first husband mm -hmm. uh, and I were traveling for almost a year um, back in the hippie days in 1974. Uh, we thought we would be going to Africa, but we met a bunch of Australians coming up from the other side. So we decided to follow their trail across um, Afghanistan, Iran, Pakistan, India. We went up to Nepal. And in those days, of course, there was no internet, and so any uh, travel updates uh, were from other fellow travelers. Mm -hmm. And so we were in Kathmandu, and we heard that Burma had opened up seven-day visas. You had to have air tickets showing you'd be in and out in seven days. We knew very little about Burma, as did the world, no, very little. So we thought, what the heck, we'll go. I was mm -hmm. 27 in those days and very interested in what I was seeing. But truthfully, I was pretty clueless about what I was seeing. So I was really living in the moment. Um, we arrived in Rangoon, mm -hmm. Rangoon. Now it's young gone. Keeps changing, but yeah. And you had two choices. We could go to Mandalay or we could go to Bagan. So we went up to Bagan. And in those days, it was even more uh, untraveled than when Burma opened up to travelers later in two, 2009 or 10. So it was pretty much us and the villagers and a very quiet, beautiful, peaceful life with hundreds or thousands of pagodas that you could just meander through. And it was there one morning while we were eating our little breakfast outside a, a tiny hut type of restaurant that a woman and I, we never spoke, but we looked at each other, held each other's gaze, mm -hmm. both ended up smiling, and I never learned anything about her. But that that moment, especially in the beautiful surroundings, was eventually the catalyst that brought me back to Burma, wanting to know more about the women there and wanting to help them as much as I could with education. Right. So... <clears throat> You know, we didn't really know what we were seeing. It really wasn't until I wrote the book that I learned more about the politics and the rights or lack of rights, um, the government situation. You know, I learned all those things after the fact. When we were there, it was just a beautiful, beautiful country. Uh, we were staying at the YMCA and uh, we were not married yet. So my, um, my mm -hmm. partner, yep. he was in the men's dormitory, raised up on wooden platforms with the ceiling fans and screens on the windows. I and 30 other women were on the floor in our sleeping bags with one window with no screens, with mosquitoes rampant all yep. night. Um, so that was my first night in Burma, where I realized, okay, if you're a guy, maybe you get a little bit more than the women are getting here. But that was my first instance. But it was it was also an image and that sense of peace, especially in Bagan, that I never felt in any of the other countries that we traveled to over that year. And there were beautiful places, but I didn't feel that an innate connection 
mm-hmm. that I did with Burma. Women in Burma, the issues that confront them and how you found the country back then and now, I mean, you've done a lot of work in country over the years, as I, under- mm-hmm. as I understand. Uh, how do they differ from elsewhere in Southeast and Central Asia? What are the issues that are facing? You know, I, mm-hmm. I learned more about that later, uh, not that 1974 mm-hmm. year. So after I retired from my kind of normal job, I was a um, purchasing director for City of Seattle here, so I worked in municipal government. So I, went, I retired there, kind of an early retirement in 2004. I um, had time to do what I wanted to do, and I ended up working for an organization, Clear Path International, a nonprofit that provided assistance to landmine accident survivors in Afghanistan, but also in Southeast Asia. So I ended up traveling extensively to um, Thailand along the Thai-Burma border and kind of sneaking into Burma, mm-hmm. um, Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos, and yeah, pretty much those countries. So what I was learning then about women's rights was that actually they were better than in some of the other Southeast Asian countries. Right. But when I dug into it more deeply, um, especially like in, in as an example, uh, the Buddhist nuns, they can only collect alms, um, donations, once a week. The monks can go out seven days a week. Education, girls can get primary education, mm-hmm. but after that, usually they have to stop working and you know, the boys continue on. Where in some of the other countries, let's say Vietnam, a yep. good communist country, um, there was more emphasis on education throughout, but women's rights were in the toilet there also. So it was, there were subtle differences. For me, though, it was when I started going regularly with my nonprofit educational empowerment, which empowers women and girls in Burma. Um, I lost my train of it's thought okay. there. That's okay. You were just saying um, about when you were traveling through Burma in terms of empowering women and girls, and uh, you're coming into that off of Vietnam where uh, their rights are still in the toilet, but it's a communist country, so at least it's fair. <laughs> yeah, it, um, it was all about education, mm. um, the lack of education that really drew me to helping the women and girls in Burma. Uh, many of the things that we tried to do with the nonprofit was like to provide an opportunity where girls wouldn't be able to continue. And one example of that was we worked with in a small village in Bago in the central area of Burma that um, created their own microfinance program. So it wasn't a big government run, bank run kind of thing. The village ran it. So they really owned it and took ownership of it. And it was small business loans, $35 loans, and it would be for a woman to start her own little business with the hope that yep. her daughter, her secondary school age daughter, could continue on and not have to work because the mom would be making money. They were all so desperate to have education, but they didn't even know in those early days before the country opened up what was available to them. Uh, Burma's it's always struck me as a fascinating place. I, I think one of the reasons why, and I don't think there are any surveys to back up my assumption, but it is quite remarkable how educated and self-taught Burmese people are, or the people of Myanmar. Yes. yes. Um, started educational empowerment. I'd come home and I'd say something about Burma. Yeah, no sure. one had any idea what country in the world I was talking about. Mm-hmm. And... That was when I knew I wanted to try to expand awareness of the country, because to me, the people are more amazing than people I've met everywhere, and I've traveled all my life. Literally, if a man or woman has a dollar in their pocket, only it would be chat there, yep. um, they can get, get half of it, at least, to someone that they think it's more. 
and they're the only people that I've ever met where, you are, where they are just so absolutely giving to others. Even more reason why I wanted to tell people about that, that mm-hmm. country. It was amazing and fascinating to me to watch Burma open up. So when I started going back more regularly, it yep. was with this organization, Clear Path International, wow. that would be helping with landmine accident survivors, teaching people how to make their own prosthetics for each other if they lost their limbs in a landmine accident, things like that. What year was this? Uh, this was in 2009. Right. So yep. the country was still pretty much closed. I was able to go in there as an American, but it wasn't a tourist area yet. So then, shortly thereafter, I think primarily in 2010, and this is my opinion, the um, military decided that it was to their economic gain to open up the country more. Yeah, you're quite right. So watching it, yes. So then watching the people become aware of the outside world and the outside world becoming aware of them, but watching and them learn that who was out there and what educational opportunities there were. So before the country closed again in 2021, young people were able to go to college in other countries. So, I mean, all of a sudden, they were able to do what their people their age were doing in other countries. Yep. And when the coup happened, I think these people had learned from contacts on the internet, because they Mm -hmm. were definitely very connected, how to set up their own civil disobedience movement, how to, uh, if the self-service goes down, how to set up their own backup system. So when the coup happened in wee hours of February 2021, it didn't stay closed for long to the people who really knew how to get, get news out and get news back in. Yep. And so I don't, I know that mm-hmm. people, young people especially there, will never, ever be closed up again. When I was there for the first time in 2009, I met with a young group of young people who were, in my mind, activists. Some were more interested in bringing music to youth or education or um, anything. And so they were, right in my mind, very aware of the country that they lived in. Mm-hmm. And I was sitting around the table with them, and a very lovely woman, a British woman, was translating for me. And I started telling them about how in some of the other areas, the military would go in, they would burn down the village, but they would give the villagers maybe an hour to pack up what they could carry. And then the people would leave. They would burn down the village, and then they would plant landmines in the fields so that if uh, farmers went back to get food for their family, they would um, be blown up or lose a limb. And so I mentioned that to these young people. And the British woman who was translating for me, she pulled me aside afterwards, and she said, Oh, Melody, I wish you wouldn't have said that. You're putting them at risk because they don't know those things. And I felt horrible, but also I was absolutely shocked to learn that these young, aware people, or to my mind, they Mm -hmm. seemed very aware, did not know what was happening in the ethnic state right next to them. Um, So they were absolutely so closed off. And when I tell people here about it being a closed country, they have no idea what that means. They've heard of North Korea. But they were so closed, and I know they will never, never let that curtain come down on them again. Unfortunately, so many people are still dying and starving. A young man I met here where I live in Bainbridge Island, Washington, Mm -hmm. uh, he's from Chin State, and he was telling me that his grandparents still live in the Chin State, and it costs the equivalent of 11 U.S. dollars for two eggs. So his grandparents can't eat eggs anymore because I think they've already eaten the chickens. Uh And so it, again, for me, puts into perspective, I whine about this, I whine about that, and then I go, Melody, how many eggs didn't you have in the refrigerator? Right. Uh, It's 
it's really difficult for Westerners to put themselves in shoes of people like this. But the Burmese people are strong, and they still help each other. And I just love them for that. And the women, oh, my God, they are so strong. I mean, the men are, too. Don't get me wrong. Mm -hmm. But the women, they can endure so much. When I was with this other organization, Clear Path, we went up on to the border in between Thailand and um, Burma to a displaced person camp, Loi Talang. Right. And so people had lost their homes, the villages burned or whatever, you know, so they were all living there. And the organization was trying to provide alternative income generating activities for the, the villagers there, like growing mushrooms and selling them or piglets or those kind of things. Somewhat like my connection with a woman, I call her the woman on the stoop in Bagan. I had a similar experience there. I was up early one morning walking around in the good light, taking photographs. And I saw this beautiful young woman with her little toddler strapped to her back. And we just stopped and looked at each other and smiled. And mm -hmm. I knew then that I was going to leave Clear Path. Their mission was great, but I didn't relate to it as much as I would relate to educating women and girls. So I knew then I was going to start my nonprofit. And I went home and started the 501c3 app. And shortly thereafter, I was legitimate. Right. So it's, it's an yep. unusual country. And it, the, the book I wrote yep. is all about creating awareness for the country, for Westerners. I included six short stories, because I know that fiction short stories people will breeze through, and it's easier to understand what people go through in a country if it's a fictional short story. And in these stories, it's about women, women I know, but it's fiction, who um, have faced unimaginable challenges, but they are strong, and they didn't know they were strong, but they are, and they stepped up, and maybe they had to follow a path that they never would have thought of before, like escaping over that mountain ridge from Burma into Thailand, or uh, getting a loan and running a business so that their secondary school daughters could go to school, or fleeing their country into Thailand and living in a refugee camp for almost 10 years and right. then finally moving and immigrating to the U.S. even though it wasn't easy. So um, mm -hmm. I have the utmost, utmost respect for this country and these people, the men and the women. Okay. If you had to choose a favorite character from Intrepid Paths, which one would it be? Well, it would be in the last story in the book. It's called The Choice. But it was the first story I wrote, and I started it a couple days after the coup started. Mm -hmm. And it's a story, her name is La May, and her sister is Chi Chi, and they're from the Shan State. Her parents had passed. La May and Chi Chi moved into Yangon, thinking that they could get an education there, and they were, and then... The coup happened, and La May was part of the civil disobedience movement, and she was in downtown Yangon, across from the Byoko Market, and they had hung up the laundry skirts that the women there, they had hung them up as banners across the roads, because that they knew that the military junta would not walk under women's clothing. So they could close the roads down, they could stop the economy, and they don't have weapons, they couldn't do that. It was a peaceful demonstration, but it was very effective. And then La May was accosted by a man, terrified, she ran home. She and Chi Chi decided they would leave, and they did. It was a, mm -hmm. quite the journey for them to get up to the crest in between Burma and Thailand. And I won't give away the end of the story, As but you should they not. were seeking education. Right. Pardon me? As you should not give away the end of the story. I know, because I thought it was hmm? a sad ending, but yet it was also what happens there. Okay. When so you... it was a, a truthful ending. 
Right. Well, when you look back at the early days of, I guess, what you were running in terms of uh, prosthetics and uh, empowering women in terms of uh, small loans, mm -hmm. which were basically the uh, earlier days of microfinance institutions, are you, uh, to ask a loaded question, are you disappointed with the way microfinance has gone over the past decade? Well, around the world, yes. Yeah. You know, because I know that it, it's talked up so much, but, and I, you know, not an expert in that. I assume it was like big money won over. Well, the big, they turned um, into banks. That's just, yeah. You know, they're becoming yeah, regular yeah, banks, the and so the, per, the, um, the original purpose I is think the difference, long gone. The difference mm -hmm. with this one that we set up, it was owned by the village. Mm -hmm. So, People who lived there knew they had to pay their loans. They had to do well because they lived there. Right. And we had a 99% return rate on their payments. The in small amount of interest went back into the village for a school for primary uh, grade age uh, children. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe if it's run on a smaller basis where people actually take ownership, it can work. But I think that in what I've read, the larger ones, it's it's a great idea, but not yep. always successful. I've always wondered how some of these people, predominantly male, I guess, cope with these MFIs because it kind of undermines their power. If you're empowering women who can raise their own cash to set up their own businesses, then they're no longer being, mm -hmm. not necessarily deliberately held down by the system that's in place, but it does erode the authority of those who are traditionally in charge. And uh, I'm kind of mm -hmm. wondering if um, you know, the kids in Burma refer, refer to kind of post-2010 as the light, as in if you go up there these days, it's, if you can get across the border, or, or in the towns like Mae Sot or Chiang Mai, and you meet mm -hmm. a lot of the, mm -hmm. the rebels who are fighting the conflict, you know, they'll tell you that mm -hmm. uh, we saw the light, we experienced the light, we know what life is, we're mm -hmm. not going back to the way things were. And um, MI5s in that period, the type, type of loans that uh, you, were, you were responsible for, had a great deal to do with that. And uh, I can't imagine the junta and uh, General Min Ong Hang uh, accepting that kind of uh, erosion of authority, perhaps. That's an excellent point, Luke. Right. I think it just adds more fodder to their uh, anger and their greediness. Um, because if the women are making the money, then the men aren't, and then yep, yeah, yep. yeah, yeah. Uh, it's um, go on. You have the floor. Oh, I was, yeah, I was finished with that. <laughs> That's okay. Uh, where are you now with Burma? I mean, you were in Afghanistan, which is uh, part of my uh, history, and uh, you, you're involved with empowering women there as well. Tell me a little bit about that. I know you've had issues in terms of maintaining those programs over recent months or perhaps the past year? Are you talking Afghanistan or Burma? Yeah, Afghanistan. Afghanistan uh, was a, um, a new, um, let's say, gig for mm. me recently. Well, we live in the gig um, economy, so, so, yep. Yeah, it, um, I think that the organization that I was uh, on the board for, for with a while mm -hmm. was, is a very... Uh, committed to empowering girls in the horrific situation that they have in Afghanistan. But I realized for me right now at this point in my life, I needed a little bit more, less chaos, let's say. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, now my contacts in Afghanistan, um, the requests for help that I've received, particularly since the fall of Kabul back to the Taliban, uh, have been enormous, mm -hmm. uh, but the ability to do anything and contribute anything constructive is it's almost impossible now. It it really is. It's um, in this particular organization. It's an Afghan woman um, mm -hmm. is the founder and director, and she was active in the country, uh, helping thousands of girls uh, 
be in a situation to receive an education, whatever that may look like, it usually with schools that she found. But then they also, when the Taliban took over around the same time as Burma School in 2021. Yes, it did. Yep. Uh, they, she couldn't stay there and do that anymore. So she's now trying to do it from outside. But she has to be really careful. Um, yep. You know, the schools that she does have children in, she cannot let anybody know which schools they are. Uh, it's, it's just so absolutely heartbreaking for these young women and luckily in today's world there um you can learn off a computer so if you, you right. get internet and get a computer you can get a college education mm-hmm. and so for a lot of these um especially adolescent age girls in afghanistan it's not what they had hoped it would be but it does keep their minds working and it enables them to help maybe younger girls who are trying to learn as much as the older one has been learning and who knows what will happen with Afghanistan's future yep. but it, it at least you know creates a situation where there's maybe some hope uh, this particular organization also works with getting uh, kids off little ones off the streets mm-hmm who are um, picking up plastic bags and trying to sell them or whatever, not in school, getting maybe 50 cents a day to give to the family for food. But she's trying to get them in off the streets and get a little education. And so far what she's been able to do, although small scale, and she's hoping to be able to ramp up, even though, as you say, Mm. a lot of, donors who would have given money to Afghanistan previously, like a lot of money, yep. they're hesitant to do that now. So she, it's kind of a dicey thing to try to ramp up and impact more uh, children and young women within the um, fundraising world that it is now. It's also dangerous. Uh, the more you get involved, the, the more careful you have to be because... Uh, well, we can skip in and out of these countries when appropriate, but uh, at the same time, the locals have to remain behind and they have to deal with the authorities. And whether it's the Taliban or the junta in Burma, the more help they get or the more empowered that they become, the angrier the authorities seem to be. I mean, okay, Afghan women mm-hmm. can now uh, self-educate They can organize themselves a little bit better and have some form of comms with the outside world. So what does the Taliban do? It bans women from speaking in public. I mean, really? You know, know, it's kind of... um, And they will tout that under Islamic Sharia law. It's complete nonsense. Oh, yeah, it's unimaginable. I mean, it was never Mm. as bad in Burma for women. I don't think it's as bad anywhere in the world, although I don't know as much about Korea. But, right. uh, you know, to not be able to speak in public, well, of course, you can't go out in public unless you're with a, a male. Yep. It, it's, it's hard to even relate to. And yet, it's such a beautiful country. I remember back in 74, entering at Herat, on the yep. west coast of Afghanistan, and it was dusk. And so crossing over the border... Men on horsebacks with white robes flowing in the wind, lantern lights along the road. I thought I had stepped back into time, but it was such a beautiful, beautiful country, um, and I hope that their future mm-hmm. bodes better in um, as the years go by. It's heartbreaking, though. Yeah, there's not much to do for Afghanistan except hope, unfortunately. Uh, what are your plans yeah. next? Uh, the book is out. Uh, Burma is still in dire need. You've got uh, your ins and outs there. What are you planning over the next few years? Well, I'm not sure. When I mm. I ended up finishing my book, Intrepid Pass, I've been thinking about it for a couple of years. I wasn't sure if it was going to be nonfiction or what I was going to do mm-hmm. with it. And, you know, started trying to find a publisher that might take it on. And I'm so excited, though, that there are so many more books about Burma out there now and news articles, et cetera. Yeah. I mean, before there was none. 
but I just couldn't decide what to do. And mm-hmm. then about a year and a half ago, I ended up having a close call with mortality. I was uh, diagnosed with this lung disease, this terminal, and then I luckily got into the world's expert in this disease at University of Washington, and he didn't think I actually had that disease. He did his magic. A couple of months later, he determined I didn't, and so then I had this, all of a sudden, a new mm-hmm. lease on life, and I decided, okay, Melody, finish that book. Whatever it's going to look like, write the book. So, so I did. So I focused on that. Then. Let, let, let me get this straight. So, year plus. so you were diagnosed with a disease. It doesn't matter what, but you were told you were going mm-hmm. to die by a doctor. And then you got a second opinion. Yes. And the second opinion yes. was like, uh, perhaps not. That must have been, yeah, hell, yes. that, that's I mean, a hell of an experience in itself. It, it really was. You know, I, I had about six months of living in the mindset of terminal disease. Mm. And it, it was one where the lungs, the, the, uh, lungs develop all the scar tissue. So ultimately you suffer, 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 and then you can't breathe anymore, which kind of creeped me out. So, but I, I live with that, and I've had a wonderful life. I feel very fortunate for the places I've been able to see and the people I've met and my family and friends and everything. And then six months later, all of a sudden, I was told, well, no, no, you would actually don't have that. And that was wonderful news, but mm-hmm. trying to flip my um, what that means. And I talk about that in the last chapter um, of my book called Reflections because it, it was unusual to think you're going to die and then all of a sudden miraculously have it turned around and to be able to breathe freely now and you know etc so i'm 77 years old now and still young for 77 and when i joined the board for this afghan nonprofit, which loved the mission loved the founder everything but i just realized i need more calmness Mm -hmm. So I think what I'm going to do, I've become more active with the um, Burmese communities locally here yep. and um, started working with them. And some of them have been here a while, but a lot of the youth still, you know, are kind of struggling with English and whatever. So I think I'm going to focus my energies there. Also, I'm looking to go up to our local high school here. Mm-hmm. and uh, see if I can start talking with some of the students there in their classes. Uh, tell them about Burma. Tell them about women and girls' rights and all the things that I'm very passionate about. So I would like to do that. And I still want to travel on my own, but and I would love to go back to Burma at some point. If they opened it up, I don't care how old I am, I'm going back because I have dear, dear friends there who I miss terribly, and I can't really communicate openly with them because it puts them at risk. You need to see them in so, person. Um, I know, I know, I do, you know. Um, so I would definitely go there. But I think I'm yep. going to kind of, it's hard for me to take a little bit more low-key approach. I know when I decided to mm. resign the board after only being on it for a month, it's got to be the shortest board tenure ever. Um, my husband, who had been very supportive of me, and he said, what were you thinking? You know, I yeah. didn't want to say anything, but <laughs> I thought you were going to kind of rest. You had the health thing, and then you were writing the book. And uh, So anyway, you need, um, I'm very fortunate. You need to stay active, and you need to stay involved. Otherwise, what's the point? Yeah, I bet you feel that way, too. It's um, mm, Absolutely. You know? Indeed. Melody Machuski. Uh, the author of Intrepid Paths, <laughs> who has uh, an extraordinary history in terms of uh, travel and your work with the Burmese community and the Afghan women. Thank you very much. It's been a delightful chat. Thank you, Luke. I really appreciate your time.